What's up everybody, Victor here with OmniPrint with another session of Creators One-on-One -on -one with my friend Ali Sabet. And what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about how to push through as an artist, ways to monetize, how to build an audience, and how to push it to the next level. We're talking a little bit about NFTs, talk about mindset and leveling up. All that is happening right now. And make sure you subscribe and like and follow at Sabet for more of these videos. All right, guys, let's get going. What's up, everybody? Victor Pena here with another session of Creators One-on-One. -on -one. Today, I'm super pumped up because my buddy, Alisa Bet is here. Bro, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having really me. Really appreciate it. Especially, you know, since, you know, you, you just got surgery, you're, you're doing amazing, so you're out there. So I really appreciate you being here, being able to show you around. No, it's, it's been wonderful, man. Thanks for showing me around. Obviously, awe-inspiring to see what you've created from scratch all these years. I've just watched you grow and become into this incredible, you know, empire <laughs> which uh, hey, we're still, uh, printing we're, I love yeah it. exactly well i appreciate that man the, the, the main mission for us is to empower others mm -hmm. entrepreneurs to grow and thrive with print on demand and you know especially creators out there for you guys that don't know he's a big artist he's a creator so a lot of the things that we want to talk about today is you know kind of showing your journey um you know what what kind of inspired you to start doing you know maybe tell the audience a little about who you are sure. what you do uh, also we'll tag you know your instagram too if you could share that and that way people can follow them and all that well my first name is ali and most people uh, in on instagram and on social go by my last name which is sabit uh, it's really kind of funny when I say it together, Ali Sabit. Some people go, who's Elizabeth? Especially if you're sp Spanish speaking. Yeah. And they're like, oh, it's yeah. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, <laughs> yeah. But it is E and last name is Sabit. So I'm a painter. I'm a full-time artist. I make a living out of painting and selling my work in different fashion, you know, whether it's NFTs, which is digital format, to, you know, putting it on products or licensing the work. That's how I've been kind of making a living for the past five, six years. Prior to that, I had a branding agency for 20 years where I did logos, websites, packaging, naming of companies. Some that you might know is, for example, I designed a company or an app called Flipagram, which ended up selling to a Chinese company that converted it to a little tiny app we know now as TikTok. Wow. So I got my first and my my the first round of what TikTok was supposed to look like was designed by me no way years i ago. didn't know that that's crazy uh, or thayer's witch hazel which is thayer's brand which is a huge brand now bought by l'oreal i designed everything for them about seven eight years ago and they did really well so it was a matter of being able to create art that could help people sell stuff I'd had enough of that and I was ready to move on. And in 2015, I decided that I was gonna be a full-time painter. Wow. So it took, you know, you remember back then, I mean, I was drawing and, you know, painting every day and, and then designing at night to pay the bills. Uh, it took about four years to complete that process of finally being able to sell prints and things like that on social media to be able to make a living yeah, and then stop doing the branding and the design work. Man, that's incredible. So. And, and for, for a lot of people that, that are watching this, there's, there's some that are trying to make this transition mm -hmm. from one thing to another. So what, what helped you say, all right, well, man, I, gotta, I don't want to do the, career, the agency anymore. I want to just be an artist full time. Uh, like what, what pushed you off that ledge? Well, I think after 20 years of always having one foot in it, one foot out, I had to do it because I had three kids, I had a family. I mean, as soon as I, we got married, we had our first and second. So that I never had an opportunity not to, unless I made a conscious decision, it wasn't gonna happen, right? And I really didn't know where I was gonna go anyway. My other side creativity was always to create characters. So I was more of a character designer. I loved Hello Kitty and Sanrio, and that's where I really saw my success would be coming from someday the dream would be to have a brand kind of like that. 
which I do now. I have a couple. One's Tokyo Punks, one's Pixel Pop that do fairly well. But it wasn't like that. For you know, I tried. I would print T-shirts and put in the trunk of my car and end up losing all my money because I'd <laughs> used the last bit of credit on a credit card to have the screen printer make me T-shirts. And then I would end up selling them out of the trunk of my car for gas money and food because I broke. And then I would have to start that process all over again. What I realized, the first thing is, is like you have to do some soul searching and see who you are and what, what you really want, right? 2010, I get back into drawing the characters after I'd quit for a while. And Instagram was kind of becoming a big thing back then. So me drawing and sharing every day, I started to see myself more as an artist and not this wannabe entrepreneur that wanted to sell millions of dollars worth of t-shirts. So now I felt successful because I had an audience and I was drawing every day and I felt good about that. And I was making my money elsewhere. I was still doing the logos and websites, but now I was happier because I had a purpose. I was sharing my love with the world. Whereas most people think, how do I make money off of my art? And I made a conscious decision in 2010 when I got on Instagram that the idea was only to create the art and share it with the people without ever thinking about monetizing it or even branding or packaging it. So I stopped myself from creating a logo. I stopped myself from packaging it on t-shirts and things like that. And I just shared. And after a few years of that, then the other stuff came, the, me painting the feminine images, the girls, the women, all of the other stuff came because of that success that I had there. Now I felt free to even express more of myself, more love uh, outwardly. And then that's when the transition, as the transition was happening, I was like, all right, now I have an audience and I have educated my audience on who I am and I consistently have to do that still to this day and how I do the work and why I work and all of that good stuff. And now I have to make it you know, available for people to be able to purchase. Yeah. And that's how you start, you know, so it's a transition. Man, that's great. So do this if you want to become a successful artist. Like the number one thing that you can do is create an audience first. Because that's what I, that's, that, that was a big takeaway for me from, from what you did is you, you held back from your natural instinct to try to sell something, mm -hmm. right? I, I need to sell something, yeah. right? I need, to, I need to transact. But you, you were just drawing sharing drawing sharing mm -hmm. building up the audience that to get to know you first yeah, absolutely warming it up and i think a lot of the times and i see it a lot people will build a website mm -hmm. they'll get everything they'll do a collection mm -hmm. and with with print on demand it's easier to do that now but back in the day you had to spend a ton of money to get your first collection done right and you don't even know who you're going to sell it to right. and what you're going to sell. So it, it becomes a very, very risky situation. I still have from different brands that I've launched yep. over the years. I have a bucket probably in storage of baby boy and friends. And that was one of the brands, 1999. Then I had Snooki and there was a whole brand called Snooki. I have another 10, $15,000 in t-shirts sitting somewhere. They're probably going to be worth something someday yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. when I bring them out. It as, better the be archives. you're still paying for storage on, yeah, that, right? on that deal. They're going to be worth something interesting. They're going to be like archival museum quality, you know, T-shirts for framing. But back then, that was it. Like I would, I remember the first one I did was Tenoshi Twins T-shirt. And like right now, I just watched one of your machines do this amazing like print, right? Like that subtle white you know, and then, and then the color on a black t-shirt. So I had black t-shirts yeah. and I had to have screen printed and it was a comic strip. It was a whole comic strip and it was on black t-shirts. The white was so thick that they had hit it so hard that by the time they had put all the other colors on, if you wore that t-shirt, you'd be sweating <laughs> like you had a sweat. Yeah. So, you know, that was like a mistake. You know, I ended up having to give all of those away. And, you know, you, you went through all those things because back then, it was all about starting a trend. It was all about starting some sort of, you know, becoming the next Paul Frank or, you know, that. And then you'd read these like success stories, right? And that this guy started out of his, the, you know, the trunk of his car. And, and, you know, you didn't think it would take 10, 15, 20 years. But until it got to a point where I think one year I just read one of those stories in Entrepreneur Magazine. And I'm like, 
I'm just too old for this shit. Yeah. I, I'm too old to read these now. <laughs> you know, the whole, you know, millionaire before 30 yeah. is over. I'm, yeah. I'm 40. Yeah, you exactly. know, it's like, so I stopped looking at that and I started expressing and sharing my love with the world and having those channels of social media to give me that access was brilliant. And today, you know, I get to share it with millions of people, yeah. not only because of that, but because of, for example, NFTs or, and, and and then and beyond because I'm starting to see the power of now coming outside of the digital realm and NFTs and going back into the real world and the potential is so much bigger. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I love that. And I mean, to like, tell me a little bit about your journey going from sharing the, sto just sharing your stories to figuring out, okay, well, I think I have something like, what was your first hour? Who who reached out? Who did you reach out? Where you thought, okay, man, I think I think this is hitting. Right. Year is 2016. I got to go to Japan because I got invited to a show. I'm a little bit confused on how I'm going to go because I didn't have the money. And I was, again, selling prints for a living on Instagram. And no more designing logos and high-level stuff, yeah. you know? So it was a crazy transition because once that phone started, stopped ringing, of people wanting not only my design work, but my intellect and my, you know, design prowess and brand strategy prowess and all of that stuff. There was a quiet place where I was like, this is weird. I'm not needed anymore. I'm not wanted in this world anymore. So then I was like, then I woke up one day and I'm like, what do I want to do today? And I was like, it was up to me to create the day. And that was first and very empowering. Second, I was going to go to Japan. And I remember I met this guy, Spencer at the Natural Product Expo, which I used to go a lot because I used to do a lot of different products at the Natural Product Expo. And Spencer met me and I told him the whole story of like, I'm an artist, but I'm kind of starving. I'm trying to like, I've transitioned, but it's not enough, and, you know? And he's like, he taught me something and, and he's the one who kind of pushed it to the next level was, and I probably had about 15, 20,000 followers on Instagram. I used to sell a few prints here and there, but nothing big. And he goes, if you want to sell art, you need three things. You need an audience, you need to educate that audience, and you need programs. So what are programs? Programs are exciting marketing things that you can do to make it fun for your collectors to want to collect, uh, right? So I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, you're going to do a flash sale. I was like, what? what? I, I can't even sell one. Yeah. Like, you want me to do a flash sale of what? He goes, you're going to paint five pieces a day and every day you're going to come and take pictures of it, edit it, and put it on your website. You're going to sell those physicals for $25, originals, on the first day. The second day, $50. The third day, $75, and $100. And you're going to do this for a month. And he did an Excel cheat for me, and he showed me the future of it and what would happen. I was like, dude, nobody's going to buy this. He goes, just do it. It took me a few days to like really get myself to want to do it. And I finally did. I painted five pieces during the day, and I'm quick. You know, I was doing smaller pieces. And I throw them on my website and I put out, you know, Sabin in Tokyo flash sale. Like it was the fundraising to go. And I was like, all right, so five available today, only today at 8 p.m. When I, and I dropped it at 8 p.m. and it was like a drop, you know? And I dropped it at 8 p.m. and Spencer, the guy who taught me this whole thing, bought all five at the same time. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> it's gone. And he's like, congrats, you know? And he bought them. Oh, that's awesome. I was like, all right. So it gave me some like little bit of energy and things like that. So the second day I put another five and boom. And I thanked everybody on social media. Like, thank you so much. This was amazing. I appreciate you. Uh, day two starts tomorrow at 8 p.m. So like a whole nother day of painting. And I was doing lives during the day. I was doing Facebook live. I was doing video clips while I was creating the art. So there was this tension being built up yeah. constantly with this program. And the second day, I end up selling all five and three of them Spencer bought, two of them his friends bought. But again, that allowed me to say thank you to everyone and so on and so forth. By the third day, I think Spencer might have bought one, but the rest started being purchased by my followers. And I sold 172 paintings, scaling all the way up to I think five to $600 in that month, in that 30 days. I think it made $40,000. And it was, I love that. it was fun, I felt like, the power is in our hands, yeah. right? And as long as we have these things of building an audience, 
educating your audience on who you are and why you're doing what you're doing, and three, creating programs that are exciting and fun, you're going to sell work. Yeah. And I continued to do flash sales, I want to say almost every six months. And then I had like these two, three day sales. And eventually that didn't work anymore because it gets boring. Then I was doing daily auctions on Instagram where five or six people would win the same piece as prints. And then NFT started, which changed wow. my life. Wow, that's amazing. So a, a huge takeaway, guys, that there's ways as a creator, as an artist, to create momentum, mm -hmm. right? You could either create bad momentum or you could create positive momentum. And it takes like one thing repeated every day to create great momentum, right? So you did that and you were able to push through mm -hmm. a limiting belief that you had. Absolutely. That I can't even sell one. Yep, yep. kind of do it. So uh, for, for a lot of artists, I see that, uh, you know, I see a lot of bad ones, right? Because we see a lot of ones. Right. And, and plus, it, it, it's not even mine to judge. It's more of like uncommitted. Yeah. That's kind of the, the, main, the main thing that, that we see. And, and my point is, if you don't have that commitment, then you can't try to push through the limiting beliefs because everybody's got them. Right. Oh, how can I make 40 grand when I can't even sell one? Yeah. And that was like 30 days prior. That was the conversation. Like literally, this isn't, how am I going to do this? Uh, you know, and how is the question as soon as you have a, you know, a, a, and you work it backwards, like he did, he pulled out an Excel sheet. You, if you do this, it'll do this. And it, sure enough, it did. And by the end of it, I even got, you know, a, a little bit more, I had a little bit of gusto. I'm like, oh, let's do some big, huge paintings now at the end of the day for a thousand dollars and even sold those at the end, you know, which was like the bonus, you know? And, but these programs basically allowed me, once I transitioned into the NFT world, a lot of the artists in the NFT world had a lot of fear on minting, which is the process of p placing an art piece for sale on, and as an NFT, they had a lot of fears going in, going, oh, I should put this just one. There was a whole big deal about your Genesis piece, the first piece you're ever gonna mint. Whereas when I came in, I, was, I didn't know any better. I hadn't listened to all the NFT people by going, oh, I just put one, it's sold. Okay, maybe I'll do one another couple of days. I, I dropped like 70 pieces on like day one. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm going to price them all over the board. And I had a big confidence by that time because I knew what was selling in physical world, yeah. right? I, I didn't know how big of a deal NFTs could be either. I mean, I'd seen people selling thousands of dollars worth of stuff and just for a couple of days and I put a bunch of them up. But the first piece that I minted before I put up everything else, the first one that I sold was $800. It was an edition of 10 and I was like, and I had been used to it. Like my office was this big and I'd been, it was full of boxes of yeah. me shipping prints. And so my body just always was used to printing, sh signing, packaging, rolling, like drawing on the box, all of that stuff. And all of a sudden I sell an NFT for $800 and I'm like, yeah, there's no cost of goods here or time. Wait, what I, that's it? And I had painted it three years prior, right? So it's like, I didn't even paint it for NFTs. And then the second one sold, and the third one sold, and the fourth one sold. I was using the same tactics as programming selling physicals. Here's a program, there's 10 available. You know, they're at 0.5 ETH, which is around 800 at the time. And if you purchase one, I'll send you a free physical piece. I didn't know nobody gave a shit about physicals back then. Yeah. But some did. Yeah. People who, who, who bought that piece are really happy today because you can't get that piece like less than, I think, twenty or $30,000. There's only one for sale right now. And there's 10 of them. But yeah, that was my first one. And my body just wanted to like print it and ship it and all this stuff. And nope, it was done. And then sold 10 of those. And... It was the most magical moment because I knew that there was no, the potential was infinite with yeah. NFTs. And I took to it like, you know, like whatever you can imagine. I just went all the way in. Yeah, you hit it hard. I was all the way in. Two years straight. And to this day, I think we have over 100,000 NFTs out there in the world. 60,000 of them I gifted to people. So just, you know, serving all the collectors that had helped and, create the success in two years. And here we are today, you know. That's awesome. So how, how was the NFT world for you? Like getting in, minting, did you have to 
have someone do it, you figured it out all yourself, like, how did you get rolling into that? The way I see it is like someone who's trying to like learn a bike, like ride a bike and like you're relentless, you're like r riding it, you're falling, you're falling on your head, but then you're picking up and you're, so I was just fumbling through it. It wasn't, you know, they're like, you need a wallet. And I got like this off-brand wallet. I didn't get a MetaMask, for example, which is the big one. I went to all these different applications and I filled out one. They're like, you have to wait two weeks to get in. So Known Origin, which is now owned by eBay back then, it was a smaller application or a website. Uh, they accepted me and they brought me in. And today, again, I'm the number one artist on that platform. After two years, I've sold over 4,500 paintings wow. on that on that platform which is i think I, I think the next person might have sold a couple thousand so it's just been it's been an incredible ride uh, but that's how i kind of got in i got in with one of them allowing me in i uploaded a few like not knowing i mean back then gas fees to mint one piece was 180 dollars, and it felt like a mistake yeah you're like what i gotta pay 180 dollars just to place this on sale and and then you did it, and then you made $800 on one of the 10, you're like, all right, I, I get it. Okay, yeah. And it was about building an audience all over again. So I didn't know it was on Twitter. I found it on Twitter. I found it on Clubhouse. And I was, as soon as I would learn something, I would be in Clubhouse sharing it with other artists. And that's how I got known. Uh, the more I shared in Clubhouse, the more people purchased my work because there was other people sitting there listening that were collectors. So that was the hype cycle of the first year 2021 for us i mean there was guys who had been doing well before yeah 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 because i remember i think you know i i had been following it but then you know gary v did his v friends one it blew up like what like may april or may of 21 i think yeah. something like that and it, 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 was a, it was a crazy ride it was a wild ride i mean i went from you know the obscure following on instagram to going to shows and events in Miami and New York, doing signings for, you know, 500 people, having the big, I hold the biggest NFT art showcase in the world. And my first one was in Beijing, China with 500 artists and 500 screens. We did the second one in NFT NYC with Samsung as a partner. It's called Stratosphere, my show. Mm -hmm. And it's both physical and in, in the virtual reality world. I was able to meet all sorts of people. Gary V invited us to a breakfast because we were on his team for a project. You know, silly meetings with Paris Hilton. And <laughs> it did an amazing collaboration with George Lopez. Got to become friends with him and That's awesome. do, do something. I created a brand called Cha Cha Lucha, Lucha Libre Mask the characters. Yeah. And we sold like 50 original 101s together and donated it to his his kidney foundation. Man, that's awesome. So just all of this amazing stuff happened in, in like two years, whereas before I was just drawing and <laughs> sharing on Instagram. But it all starts from pushing through your limiting beliefs, showing people what you can do, and then building a community that will follow. Yeah. And then you, you, you focused on just bringing value, you know? Yeah. And that, that got you a lot of the attention because people were getting value you know i was watching i was watching i was like oh i want that piece i got one and then you're like oh you got one here let me send you another one i'm like dude oh, that's yeah that's badass and and so so it's like when when you do that you get a lot of positive momentum and goodwill so how how do you like what's next how do you take i mean obviously we know where nfts are i i really believe in the technology still yeah. overall and and you know there's there's a place for it to to both be in the physical and the and the meta world so like where where do you feel it's going next and like what are you thinking about your brands your designs your products how can you mesh the physical world to what you were doing on nfts so i mean from the nft perspective i'm still in it right yeah. as depressing and as you know sad as it seems like right now where it's like trickling in. If anybody's even purchasing anything, I don't even know anymore. I have a fairly big drop coming up in two days called Dreams, where it's about a painting that I did in collaboration with Picasso because he asked wow. me to collaborate with him. 
wow. in a dream. <laughs> and I woke up and I'm like, yeah. okay, I got to do right, this. Do <laughs> so he asked me, we were in a coffee shop. Yeah, those post, post-surgery meds. Yeah, in there. Yeah. <laughs> something, hitting, something hitting hit hard. So I woke up and I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm collaborating with Picasso. And then, so I, I'm doing a piece and again, bringing value is important. So if you purchase this piece, I will give you one Picasso inspired piece every four months, every three months. So every quarter. If you don't want that one, you can burn your piece for a more rare piece. So there's this burn huddle, you know, mechanism. But it's always about creating these mechanisms and programs that are exciting, even in a down market, to be able to capture your audience's heart to come back. And it's a lot more affordable. We're talking about, you know, you can get in at like thirty dollars to buy one or two or three. So you can buy three to burn and buy two to hold. Yeah. Right. So I still have the desire to keep going in the NFT space. And I think it's important to still keep myself there, yeah. knowing that it's going to come back in some capacity. Some say it's going to be 10 times bigger than what it was before. Some say it'll never be what it was before, but it'll come back because of the technology. Either way, you know, as someone who's built a, a good rapport with his collectors and, you know, a good community, I want to be there to continue to serve that community. But the other thing that I've noticed is in the eras of NFTs, there was a few of us that did this well, right? Not to say that I think everyone did well in their own right, and some people didn't sell, and it was difficult for them in the NFT space. And I tried to push and help, you know, the, the process of how you sell NFTs. But the way I saw it is that there are some of us that did extremely well because we had a formula, right? I know my friends like Gabe Weiss and Dario Desenia or a couple other guys who did really, really well was because they were prolific, had a lot of content, and their work just resonated with people yeah. on such a level that everybody wanted one no matter what, just because, and it wasn't about speculation of whether it was gonna double or not. So when I look at that, and I look at Gabe, I look at my work and how it did in NFTs, I go, all right, now, if you had that limiting belief of like not being able to sell one in the real world, well, all of that is out the door because I know for a fact that people were buying my work because they liked it yep. and they wanted to print one for their home because I gave them the ability to, you know, I gave them the rights. So, and because I minted so much and I was selling consistently so much, I understood that people weren't really buying my work on speculation anymore because, you know, they would buy it and then the price would fall a little bit and it would go back up. It wasn't one of those that would spike really, really high. So if that's the case, for me, NFTs have become a capsule in time of like proof of concept that I can do really well coming back into the real world. So now I'm building an online on-demand uh, print service where people can order my p uh, pieces on physical canvas prints for an affordable price, nice. you know, $100 to $200. And then hopefully with your help building more merchandise things like bags and t-shirts and things like that that are a little bit even more accessible than uh, 100 200 dollars prints but use advertising use different methods other than just social to get out there in front of millions of people rather than just a hundred thousand that we were playing with yeah. in the nft world yeah I love that. that's the concept right now that's yeah. what i'm seeing perfect so so and the reason i i ask these questions guys is to kind of give you the path of what you can model right because I think the the best form of flattery is people copying the model and then using it, right? And this is what this show is about, to see how other creators are winning and make sure that you guys can win. So if you can go from creating an audience, giving value, creating product, and now being able to create, you know, he's calling it programs, but promotions, reasons why people want to come and interact with you, drops, uh, so you want to do prints, you want to do hats, you want to do, you know, T-shirts and, and all that stuff because each of them could be a drop. Yeah. I mean, and these drops or programs or marketing schemes or whatever you want to call them can have different mechanisms, right? I got this hat coming out. This color is only going to be, you know, we're going to only make 150 of them and that's it. And it's going to be retired. That's a program. And yeah. then you get your audience excited. And I don't like FOMO. Yeah. I like more of creating a positive tension between me and my collectors. When I was doing those flash sales and I was painting during the day and then taking pictures and later on I got smarter. Later on I would paint over the month 
and then just automate the whole process later and sell prints. But that beginning, what I remember the most was that there was this magical, invisible bond between me and my collectors. When I was painting, I was, I felt that energy like connecting to everyone. Like people are waiting for these. That was the energy that was happening. I can't wait to put these five out. And later on, I don't know how much you know about like my energy healing abilities at that, yeah. which we got to talk about later. But, Dude, that's awesome. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, in 2019, it got activated and I was able to help a lot of people with different ailments from essential tremors where people's hands shake to back pains and sciatica and all that good stuff. Wow. Anyways, it was just something that I did on the side. And, and But what it taught me was that everything is about frequency, vibration, and energy. So by keeping your frequency and vibration up, then you're allowing, you know, there's no resistance to your limiting beliefs. Things just flow in for you easily, right? Just the same as I can take somebody's pain away, I can also have no resistance to selling my artwork. Wow. So that's kind of what the core <clears throat> of all of it is. It's, it's about frequency, energy, and vibration. And I built a business around that, you know, by giving more value, you know, making sure that anytime someone bought an NFT for $500 or $50 or $50,000, they were buying something that had more, you know, more value than the cash they spent with me, which is one of the principles out of the book, the Science of Getting Rich. Mm. I don't know if you've ever read that book. No, I haven't read that it's one. It's over 100 years old, but anytime things slow down, the first thing I do is go back to that book. Gratitude in advance, you know, seeing it before it happens. All of those things were in that book before anybody else wrote about it. You know, the whole manifesting and yeah. creating all of that stuff, but gratitude in advance, holding a high vibration, not being anxious, not being afraid, not being, you know, and it's normal human behavior, you know, after NFTs crashed, uh, I've had a hard time this past year kind of getting my ground and, and bringing my vibration back up yeah. and I'm like, what's going on? Like I was so high for like two, three years, you know, with the healing, with all of that stuff, nothing bothered me, but it's human nature. We, we go through a cycle, you know, yeah. and now it's time to come back to a higher vibration and connect again and build bigger. So how do you push yourself out of that, the, the down cycle into an up cycle? Like you can heal yourself pretty much, that's how you do it? Yeah, so the way, raising your vibration is actually a physical thing that you can do, right? So most people meditate, keep my quiet, some work out, I paint, that raises my vibration. If I draw for you, that automatically brings my vibration up so there's actions that wow. happen but there's simple the most simple technique is a, called the heart activation mm -hmm. and what you want to do is put your heart in resonance with your mind and the way you do that is you close your eyes you think about people you love in your heart and you expand that feeling outward and you just sit in that feeling and it's a lot different than a normal meditation that you would mm -hmm. do because as soon as your heart and mind sync up your mind quiets down your vibration goes up and you know the feeling is different. You're lighter, you're happier for no reason. Attachment to like, you know, negative thoughts and stuff just kind of become really quiet and dim and far away. And then things just start to flow towards you because you're, you literally are at a different vibration physically. There's another technique like you can stare at your finger and just through body awareness and breathing into the finger that help raise your vibration. So those are te technicals, but I'll be honest, this time it was so difficult None of this stuff was really, I could get back to feeling okay, but not the, you know, where I wanted high, to be, yeah. the high of just like cruising. And I actually saw a post today of someone saying, hey, when you can't get back up there, it's because you're not recognizing your shadow self. And instead of seeing it as like you're down and you're depressed or you're in the dumps, see it as a regenerative. Like you're back to regenerating and, and you know, looking at the shadow self and going, hey, what are those limiting? There's other deeper gremlins r running around down there that I haven't maybe paid attention to. Okay, I reached one level. I wanted to make this much all my life since I was a kid. Made it, doubled it, tripled it, but did I, did that solve anything? No, it's still, that little boy inside still has got issues, right? Yeah. So now you gotta go back to, you know, really looking at that, doing the shadow work, doing the journaling, doing the paintings, all that stuff connecting to your source again. And then I have a feeling that it's going to be, you know, the next round cycle is going to be even bigger. Man, I love that. I love that. Because a lot of it, a lot of things that come from business 
are a result of how you're feeling, how your energy is, mm -hmm. how your spirit is. So whatever you guys can do to lift your spirit up, whether it's working, or walking, meditating, whatever, that's a big unlock. I know for me, I need to work out. I need to do the things uh, to keep my, my vibrations high, yeah. you know? So, so whatever that is for you guys, you know, at least saying it, that's what's helping him push through to the next phase of what he wants to do. What, and, and, you know, I, I really love that you came and I could show you like how, how we do things here. And I'm really pumped about like your next level of growth and what you do in the physical world. Cause you've done it for multiple brands, like throughout your career so many times. You know, yeah, right? And and you've done it for yourself now, and F NFTs, and now, you know, you have a lot of cool brands that need to see the light of day. They need to see more viewers, more eyeballs. So I'm pumped to see that. What could? Where can somebody, um, you know, follow you? Your website. That way we can also link it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you can find me on Sabet Art S A B E T dot A R T, or Sabet. S-A-B-E-T on Instagram and Twitter. Twitter is big for us. And then lately, we've gotten threads, so okay, I'm doing threads too. It's like, uh, the only thing I'm not doing is dancing on TikTok. The hey, the I good thing dancing. is, you don't have to dance. You, you, you yeah. could just show, you know, you do, doing some art. So yeah. the dancing is over. I need a whole new content strategy now. Mm -hmm. A lot of work. Right, tell me about it. But I'm excited, man. I'm excited to do something with you, and I'm excited to see how we can go to the next level, you know, with Sabit.love, which is the website that I'm building the products on. Nice. Uh, I'd love to see what we can do together. So. Yeah, well, I'm super pumped. Whatever, wherever I can bring you value and help you grow, I'm, I'm pumped for that. So I appreciate your time here. I know you're a busy guy. So there you have it, guys. That was an amazing session. Thank you so much Thanks, for man. being here. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so that you can get notifications. Follow Sabet at Sabet and look at what's coming up next, all right? Because mindset, how to push through, how to do package your products and how to move to the next level. There's a lot to unpack in this episode. So watch it over if you need to so that you can level up to the next level, all right? So there you have it. We'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you for having me. Thank you, brother. Thanks, brother.